today's talk, I am so happy to be able to welcome our uh, our own uh, personal property of ours, my firm, uh, Professor of Philosophy, uh, who is uh, a very active scholar. In addition to, of course, uh, you know, doing the usual um, things that uh, being a professor here require. Uh, he's a very active scholar with numerous publications, uh, including papers and books, uh, and I want to show you the latest here, uh, reviving the left, the need to restore liberal values in America. Um, and uh, if anybody owns a copy, then uh, I will be happy to sign it. <laughs> I just checked with him. Yes, uh, he would be happy to do that. Uh, in addition to that, he manages a website um, um, I think that that is uh, primarily dedicated to um, to providing the left here, and he's posting on two blogs, uh, which one we are uh, co-administrators, philosophy uh, on the base side, and if they want to visit it, we have very uh, yeah, have good discussions going on there. Uh, so today's topic is how an ethic of care can transform politics, and I want to wish what. So today I want to argue uh, that uh, some of the political difficulties uh, that we face uh, today can be traced to some mistaken assumptions that we make, uh, uh, of course, mistaken assumptions that the theoretical support for liberalism has made uh, throughout its history. So I want to trace some connections then between uh, practical politics and political and moral theory. Uh, I'll begin by making some remarks uh, about our political situation, uh, then move on to try to expose what I think are the theoretical mistakes that I see that are working uh, in traditional liberal theory. Um, and um, and that I will suggest an alternative way of looking uh, at liberalism based on some recent work in moral psychology that will help us hopefully conceptualize some political alternatives. So um, our country faces a variety of very serious challenges, both long and short term. Uh, we have to repair our economy and get people back to work. Uh, we have to uh, deal with uh, consequences of climate change. Um, we have to uh, deal with resource depletion. We have to uh, um, fix the financial system to make sure we don't have a, another financial meltdown, um, and so on. Uh, and solving these problems will require not just tinkering around the edges of the problem, but will likely require uh, some fundamental reforms in the way our social, political, and economic institutions function. Um, solving these problems will also require uh, a good deal of uh, cooperation, both domestically among the various interest groups in the United States, and of course globally as well, because a lot of these problems have uh, a global dimension to them. Yet, if you've been uh, paying attention to the news recently, uh, you know that our politics are gridlocked. Uh, fundamental change seems difficult, if not impossible, to achieve. Uh, even policies that majorities agree we need, like cost containment in our health care system, like program to create jobs, uh, or climate change legislation, looks like it can't pass Congress in a form that would clearly solve the problem. Uh, it's beginning to look like uh, solving large problems uh, in a way that would serve the common good uh, is something that our political system can no longer do. Uh, so why is solving these problems so difficult? Uh, well, there are obviously structural impediments to change. Uh, we could talk about uh, filibuster rules in the Senate, which would be boring, but we could talk about that. Uh, or Republican obstructionism and so on. Uh, but I think to gain a full understanding uh, of the political resistance to reform, uh, we also have to look at some of the fundamental values that support uh, the status quo. Uh, one reason why action to promote the common good has trouble getting a foothold is I think over the past few decades we have put, first of all, too much emphasis on self-interest as a motive. Uh, as the continued popularity of Ayn Rand attests, too many Americans think that self-interest is not only a central human motive, but they also think it's a moral virtue, uh, indeed the only moral virtue. Uh, and the common good would be best served by predators prying fingernails from the invisible hand. Secondly, uh, too many Americans have uh, an irrational hatred of government, a uh, feeling that runs deep in our political traditions, uh, but is exploited by politicians in the business community to serve um, their narrow interests. 
And thirdly, our democracy really has become uh, an oligarchy. Entrenched interests are enormously powerful. They control the political system, and it's not obvious that there's much that we can do about it. If these political values explain why solving big problems is next to impossible, uh, it's hard to see how uh, electing more conservatives to office is a solution since contemporary conservatism uh, reinforces these values. The way forward, forward would seem to be liberalism, since that's the only alternative ideology available. But liberalism is having trouble getting traction if current polls are to be believed. I think it's rather stunning that after the multiple disasters of the Bush administration, voters seem poised to put conservatives back into power. Despite recent Democratic victories and elections, and despite what has been comparatively a successful Obama administration thus far, polls are showing uh, a lack of enthusiasm among liberals, a kind of cynicism about politics and so on, uh, that um, they respect, uh, express a reluctance to vote in, in the next election, according to the polls. And of course, Obama's, the Obama administration's standing among independents has been dropping in the polls for some time. So that some pundits are predicting uh, that Republicans might take over uh, Congress in, in 2010. Well, I think that Obama remains a popular figure, uh, but his popularity does not seem to uh, be rubbing off on Democrats or on Congress. Uh, polling data suggests that despite the disastrous conservative policies of the decade just passed, the number of people self-identifying as liberals has changed very little. Uh, in fact, the percentage of the electorate that self-identify as liberals has remained at around just over 20% since the 1970s. We're talking about a pretty large stretch of time here. And this is despite the fact that when you poll people on specific policies, uh, majorities tend to support liberal policies. And this is despite the fact that liberal policies from the past are arguably what most people would point to as the great accomplishments of our society programs such as Social Security, Medicare, civil rights protections, and public infrastructure, all liberal programs uh, that um, most people endorse, yet liberalism doesn't seem to get credit for it. But this inability to attract adherence to liberalism is not new. Uh, the past 30 years of political history are marked by the resurgence of conservatism, uh, conservatism and the gradual demise uh, of liberalism. So the main question that I want to try to answer uh, is why can't liberal ideas that offer solutions to our problems, why can't they get traction? Uh, now there are various kinds of explanations that one could offer uh, uh, for liberalism's difficulties. One could appeal to political or institutional factors to explain why liberalism, uh, why liberalism has trouble. Uh, but I want to suggest that the problem is deeper. I want to suggest that liberalism makes certain unwarranted assumptions uh, about moral psychology that harm its prospects and prevent it from being the kind of oppositional force that could reshape American values and bring about real change. So I'm claiming here that there is a relationship between the uh, practice of liberal politics and the tradition of liberal theory that has been around, of course, for centuries. Now, the, the flaw um, as I see it in liberal theory, uh, is its commitment to uh, impartialism. Liberalism defines rationality as the ability to make impartial or unbiased judgments. And it locates moral authority in this impartial point of view. That is the reason why morality has authority over us, uh, is because it's allegedly issues from this impartial point of view. And I think that this assumption has some very bad consequences for practical politics. But before I get to the bad assumptions or bad consequences, let me say more about what impartialism is uh, and uh, why liberalism is committed to it. Theoretical liberalism has, since its inception, uh, inception in the Enlightenment, operated from the assumption that questions about how people ought to live are basically subjective. Uh, different people have different desires. Uh, and there's no objective way of determining which desires we ought to have. So we basically have to leave questions about how people ought to live up to the individual to decide. And this means that, of course, that liberty and autonomy 
are fundamental values for liberalism. And this, of course, also entails that pluralism is inevitable. Uh, there will be many, many different conceptions of how to live in a liberal society. And of course, there's going to be lots of conflicts among those different ways of life. We have to cooperate with each other if we're going to, uh, to live together. We have to find some way uh, of, uh, of deciding what rules will govern our cooperation despite our differences. Um, so the problem that liberalism attempts to solve then is to get diverse ways of life to cooperate. Uh, we need to find a set of rules and procedures that we can all follow that enable us to uh, make decisions regardless of our personal choices, uh, our lifestyles, our conception of the good. Uh, assuming, of course, that one's conception of the good doesn't threaten the existence of the political community, liberalism is committed to finding some rules and procedures that would enable all, all of us to cooperate and make decisions. Liberalism is also committed to equality as a basic principle. So the rules and procedures have to treat each person in each way of life uh, equally, meaning that the rules have to be fair, the procedures have to be so the upshot then, uh, is that government has to be neutral between these different conceptions of how to live. It should not be in the business of choosing winners uh, and choosing losers, uh, which of course is why in a liberal society there has to be a separation between church and state because it's not the government's role to choose which religion is going to be dominant. Uh, that's up to individuals to choose. So liberalism is committed to finding fair procedures that guarantee equal rights and wide access to resources for as many individuals uh, with their different ways of life as is possible. But human beings are fundamentally self-interested, according to liberal theory, uh, and each person in each way of life is going to promote its own aims to the exclusion of others. So if we're going to find rules to govern us, we have to get self-interested people to limit their desires uh, in order to generate and support these fair procedures. So how do we do that? Well, the uh, traditional liberal answer is that is impartialism, is that when people enter the political arena, uh, they must commit themselves to the impartial assessment of policies, institutions, and the principles uh, on which they rest. So in other words, we are so influenced by self-interest uh, that we have to exclude from our decision-making process uh, in order to explain social cooperation that has to do with selfish desires. So impartiality then, is a necessary condition uh, for proper moral reasoning and political deliberation in public life, according to most of the traditions of, of liberal theory. Now, what does it mean to be impartial? Um, it means that personal concerns, cultural attachments, religious preferences, emotional commitments, and especially biases that are related to one's position in society, these have to be excluded uh, from our deliberation. So in other words, one must be a radically autonomous individual when we enter the political sphere. Only when we see ourselves as independent of these personal commitments can we see ourselves bound by a social contract and committed to norms and procedures for adjudicating that conflict uh, between different ways of life. And those of you who are familiar with uh, this literature will recognize this move to the impartial point of view in Kant, um, to some degree in Locke and Rousseau, and more recently, of course, Rawls and Dworkin and Habermas and even Amartya Sen in his most recent work uh, also uh, makes this move. Now, of course, this appeal to impartialism is an ideal. Uh, the claim is not that uh, we always achieve this, uh, but the claim is that this is what we should aspire to. It's the ideal that political de de deliberation must meet in a liberal society. The problem with impartialism is that it is enormously difficult for people to be objective and impartial when making ethical and political decisions because their own interests are instead. To live life to the fullest, one has to be committed to a way of life. 
and one's commitment and deep attachments that arise from a way of life are always going to be salient. They're always going to stand out as what's the most important to me. Although we can, to some degree, uh, stand back from our commitments and critically analyze them, our ability to do this is certainly not absolute. We cannot entirely objectify our way of life or our personal commitments while remaining committed to them at the same time. Any assessment of one's way of life is going to presuppose a background experiences and assumptions that prevent us from being genuine outside observers of our own experience. Liberal philosophers often argue that all human beings have the capacity for impartial motivation, uh, that we can step outside our personal point of view and make decisions. But I doubt it. Uh, human beings reason best when we reason concretely. And that means reasoning from a personal point of view. More importantly, it is not obvious why we should want to reason impartially. If a person is satisfied with her way of life, and what's the motive for looking at it impartially when it comes to politics? Uh, it isn't obvious why ordinary people who are concerned with their families and their future uh, would find a kind of uh, ironic detachment from their point of view at all attractive. So, if the liberal point of view requires impartiality, and genuine impartiality is unavailable or unattractive to most people, then liberalism obviously will suffer from a motivational deficit. In other words, liberalism doesn't tap into the motivational states of citizens in a way that would get people to identify with it in a powerful way. Liberalism demands that we have motives that most people don't have. To the extent that this kind of reasoning influences practical politics, it has some very bad consequences. Uh, it leaves us with a kind of empty proceduralism that reinforces the status quo, that resists change. So let me explain what I mean by uh, proceduralism here, what the connection is to an impartial, uh, in, impartialism. Um, according to the liberalism that I just described, justice is a matter of finding correct procedures for adjudicating disputes. Uh, rules and procedures are the aim of politics. That's the point, to come up with those rules and procedures that will govern us. So liberalism is committed to bringing all of the uh, competing interests in society to the negotiating table. Uh, it imagines politics to be a kind of conversation in which everybody is impartially committed to the search for rules by, which, by means of which we can decide what the common good is. But if no one can actually deliberate impartially, if that's something that's not possible for us, but one remains nevertheless committed to having this conversation uh, according to established procedures, then you uh, have to negotiate with all the actual biases and interests that people have, and the conversation will inevitably be, inevitably be controlled by the people with power and money in our society. So proceduralism, then, is committed to a kind of conservative. <clears throat> uh, opposition to the status quo has to be directed through these established channels only, because these are the procedures that we agree on, uh, and these are inevitably controlled by powerful interests. And so therefore, oligarchy is the natural result. And this, I think, has always been liberalism's, liberalism's blind spot. It, it under-conceptualizes power. It doesn't take into consideration how power functions in society. Of course, without impartiality, the conversation and the rules and procedures that emerge from the conversation will simply reinforce the existing power structure. How could it not? <clears throat> Thus, liberalism of this sort is powerless to conceptualize fundamental social change. Or to point, put the point differently, liberalism imagines politics to be a conversation in which well-intentioned participants all aim at the common good. But real politics does not resemble this high-minded conversation at all, it resembles pigs at a feeding trough. And I think this misapprehension of political reality is playing out in contemporary politics, in the approach of contemporary liberals. The reluctance to use Senate rules to push health care reform through, the caving into various interest groups to get health care or financial reform passed, uh, Obama's concern with post-partisanship or bipartisanship or 
change in the way Washington works, however you want to describe it. Um, these are all testimonies about how much procedural liberalism has taken hold. Following procedure is apparently more important than enacting reform. Now, I'm not claiming that the rule of law is bad, or I'm, not, and I'm certainly not claiming that uh, politicians don't have practical considerations about getting an elected so on that they have to pay attention to. Uh, all that, of course, is true. The problem is that within liberalism, the pursuit of procedure seems to be the point, not, uh, not a means to an end, but the end itself. Because that's what liberal theory says should be the point. So, what is the alternative for liberals? Well, to conceptualize an alternative, I want to shift away from political philosophy for a moment uh, and talk uh, a bit about human, motiva uh, human motivational states and about moral psychology. Traditionally, theories of human agency have operated with basically two models of human motivation and practical reason. On the one hand, we have models of agency that take our fundamental motivations to be self-interested. And what counts as rational is the pursuit of one's own self-interest. That's one kind of model that we have. Uh, on the other hand, we have an alternative model of human agency that asserts that human beings can be moved not only by self-interest, but also by something higher uh, and impartial reason alone is the uh, is usually what's appealed to them. So to be fully rational, one has to uh, be able to reason from this impartial point of view. So according to this conceptual framework, when asked to explain or justify our decisions, we uh, offer reasons that either fall into the category of self-interest, I did it because it's in my interest to do it, uh, or we offer reasons that fall under the impartial category, and that would appeal to, category, uh, to concepts such as duty, justice, moral obligation, I did it because it's the right thing to do, independently of my interests. And according to this traditional view, these categories are supposed to exhaust our motivational states. And of course, this is the picture that liberalism adopts. The only constraint on self-interest is our ability to be impartial. Now, the problem that I want to point to uh, is that these two models of motivation and practical reason leave out many of the motives and reasons that really shape our lives. The reasons and motives that you leave out are not weird, uh, they're not marginal, we are very familiar with them. In fact, they encourage activities that make our lives worth living. The ob obvious examples of these motives uh, and reasons are those in which we act out of love for particular individuals. When you, for instance, visit a loved one in the hospital, or you devote an entire weekend to helping uh, your, your kid work on a science project, for instance, uh, you're not acting out of self-interest. I mean, neither activity is particularly good for you. Uh, I don't think it's better for me that I spend an afternoon in the hospital, um, and I don't think it's, it's good for me that I give up a weekend of working on uh, some project I have in order to help my kid uh, uh, with the science project. So I'm not doing it out of self-interest, but neither am I acting out of a sense of moral duty either. I'm not obligated by impersonal or, impersonal or impartial reasons to do these things either. I'm not doing them because I think the world will be a better place if uh, my kid's science project is successful. Now, hopefully that's not the, the, the reason. Um, rather, I act out of love. These are what philosopher Harry Frankfurt calls reasons of love. And reasons of love are fundamental to us. The standard models of human action that I described earlier leave out these reasons. They don't get into the picture. That is these models here on the screen. Now, it's essential that we not get distracted by the word love here. Love doesn't have to be about other persons for whom we have affection. Uh, reasons of love move us to pursue all sorts of activities that we have a passion for. Writing philosophy, or writing history, uh, playing piano, striving to become a, an Olympic athlete, or working in, in your house, or working in your yard. Uh, these activities, if they are intensely meaningful to you, are performed out of love. They usually demand more of your time and attention 
then that w then would be best for you. People don't do that entirely out of self-interest. They cost too much time and resources and so on. But neither do we engage in them for impersonal or impartial reasons either. We don't think that the world would be a better place because of them. We do them because we love them. So there's a third uh, source of motivation that the standard model of human agency uh, leaves out. Um, and what's important about these reasons of love is that the standard that guides us is nevertheless an independent standard. It's not impartial, but it's an independent standard that is independent from my aims. In the case of acting for a loved one, it's the good of the other person that provides us with a reason uh, to act, and it's also a standard by which we measure our actions. Are we really committed? Are we really doing something for the good of someone else? Similarly, when I am engage, uh, engaged in an activity that I love, what draws me in is a standard of excellence that's not reducible to my interests. I, mean, I agonize over an article I'm writing uh, because I want to get it right. That is, I want the argument to be sound, I want the writing to be clear. It's not only for my sake that I struggle to get it right. I don't really know whether trying so hard to get, uh, get it right is going to serve my interests or not. It might be a big waste of time. It's the value of good philosophy uh, that is driving and guiding my behavior. Just as for the musician, it's not her own enjoyment that motivates her to pursue her music. Uh, it's the beauty of her music that is motivating her. It sets the standard okay, for what she does. In fact, she might have to sacrifice a great deal uh, of her, in, in, in terms of self-interest in order to achieve it. And think about how much these athletes that were watching on TV, some of them had to sacrifice uh, without achieving anything. Many of them don't get a medal. But nevertheless, they find this activity intensely meaningful. So in these cases, love explains and justifies our choices. And our choices are driven by an independent standard of excellence. So reasons of love have a distinctive and important role to play in our lives. And uh, these are not to be assimilated to uh, either self-interest or the reasons of morality or in impartial reason. And to the, extent, to the extent that we fail to recognize the legitimacy uh, of these <coughs> values, we misunderstand ourselves. Well, so what does all this talk of moral psychology uh, in, in, in have to do with politics? Well, notice that in the imagined <coughs> impartial conversation that liberalism seeks, Reasons of love are precisely what are supposed to be excluded from the conversation. Because we can't be impartial about things we love. In fact, notice that many of the concerns that liberalism has fall under the category of impartial morality. I suppose it is possible for someone to love an impartial principle of equality. Uh, but I, I don't think that motivation is particularly well distributed in the human population. Moreover, it's hard for anyone to love procedures or rules unless you're a born bureaucrat. Uh, whether a value they have for us is purely instrumental. <coughs> Notice also that our motivations in this impartial category seem less powerful than the reasons of love. Doing something because, uh, because objectively one ought to lacks the motivational strength of doing something because one loves to do it. Notice that by contrast, conservatives is very much aware of these powerful motivations we find in the reasons of love. Look at what conservatives appeal to. Patriotism, religion, security, family, local community. These generate reasons of love. I'm not suggesting that conservatism has the right account of these, but they are aware of the motivational strength of these reasons these concerns. This is why conservatism is so hard to defeat and liberalism so hard to defend. So my contention then is if liberalism is to survive, it must be about reasons of love. To the extent it remains about impartial reasons, it will continue to founder. And furthermore, to the extent it ignores reasons of love, it does not provide a real alternative to self-interest as a motive. 
This is where I want to introduce uh, the ethics of care. The ethics of care, as I understand, takes reasons of love as central to our conception of how to live uh, and how you ought to act toward others. The basic idea uh, of an ethical care is that the concrete needs of particular individuals in specific circumstances are the starting point for reasoning about what one ought to do. We don't start deliberating about moral questions from general principles or from rules of action from an impartial point of view, according to the ethics of care, but rather we become engaged with and gain an understanding of a particular person's needs. So there's no type of action that is justified independently of an assessment of a particular person in a particular situation and our engagement with that person. We can't, according to the ethics of care, derive appropriate treatment from others from impartial principles. Because we need empathy, knowledge of particulars, and compassion, and all the kind of interaction that goes on between uh, individual persons in order to know what the right thing to do is. So in other words, to make morally defensible decisions according to the ethics of care, we have to draw from these motivational states that support the reasons of love. Now, it should probably occur to you, though, that's a big problem here. Because the problem is, of course, that you can't care for everyone. No one has the time or attention or emotional resources for that. Uh, it's only by being partial to someone, those for whom you care, that an ethics of care can be activated. So although the ethics of care doesn't have the motivational problems associated with an impartial conception of duty, it has a different sort of problem. It seems focused on special relationships. It does a good job of explaining our moral relationship with our children or other family members and our friends. It characterizes the kind of attitudes that you want a doctor or a nurse or a teacher to have because they're committed to the needs of others. But it doesn't seem, at least on the surface, to explain our connection to the larger society very well at all. So, given this obstacle, then, how would an ethic of care function in the political domain? What kind of relevance does it have? In what sense could political decisions be driven by reasons of love? Well, there are, of course, people who take up the cause of social justice or environmentalism as reasons of love. Some people, for instance, do sincerely view nature as an object of love. But they are too few on which to build a political movement. So I want to suggest that the really substantive connection between the ethics of care and the revised liberalism is this. Um, Alan Wolf, uh, who is a sociologist and political philosopher, has re recently argued that the core principle of liberalism is that as many people as possible should have as much say as is feasible over the direction their lives will take. In other words, autonomy, the capacity for self-direction and self-realization, is the fundamental liberal value. And I think he's right about this. The problem is we misunderstand autonomy, especially in this country. And the ethics of care can help us reconceptualize that notion of autonomy. We used to base our notions of autonomy and of individualism on the idea of economic self-sufficiency, satisfying all your material needs by yourself. But the conditions under which we could do that have really vanished into the distant past. For all of us, our personal fate now depends on vast and personal forces which can crush any of us at any moment, as we're seeing with the, you know, the financial delta. Only the government has sufficient power and resources to bring any of these forces under control. But as a culture, I think we maintain the illusion of autonomy as self-sufficiency. We still maintain the idea that our fate is entirely up to us as individuals. We have also come to believe uh, that autonomy, self-direction, involves self-realization and self-creation as well. You know, what you are is what you buy. And I quite agree, not with the buy, buying part, but the notion that self-realization is an essential part of, of autonomy. 
But our rampant pursuit of self-realization has certainly contributed to the excessive levels of debt uh, that brought on the global financial crisis, has co contributed to climate change as well. Because I think we assume that this pursuit of self-realization has no natural limits. So if change is to come, this idea of economy must be modified. Uh, and I think uh, the ethics of care helps show us how to modify it. And that is because an ethical care is premised on the point that human lives are inescapably dependent on others and that that dependence entails moral constraints, moral commitments. Now, of course, children uh, are dependent on parents. Uh, the elderly are dependent on caretakers. These are those special relationships that I spoke of earlier. But our dependency is not limited to these special relationships. Uh, each of us is dependent on a vast network of largely anonymous persons who support the social systems that we all depend on. When we think through what we love and note their vulnerability and the kind of support they need, the practice of care cannot be restricted only to what we love. It must be extended to the social systems that support what we love and the people that make those systems work. So policies that build trust, that minimize uncertainty, anger, and fear, these are policies that are motivated ultimately by reasons of love. And here it is important to emphasize that care is not merely an attitude, it's not just a motive. Care is a practice as well a practice that entails the needs of what we care about are an independent standard to which one cares is committed. Fundamentally, the ethics of care is about commitment. Any politics that will be successful must be a passionate commitment to a way of life, not just a set of fair procedures. It is, of course, a subject of some controversy just what a liberal way of life is because liberal theorists have devoted too little attention to this question given that they think it's primarily a subjective matter. In my view, and I'm following uh, Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen on this point, uh, liberalism is a commitment to build the capabilities of people with whom you live. This is what motivates parents, doctors, and teachers. It ought to be what motivates citizens uh, as well. <coughs> Thus, political change will depend on moral change. Unfortunately, for the political prospects of liberals, uh, moral change will not happen <clears throat> overnight. Uh, Max Weber, the 19th century German sociologist, wrote that politics is the long, slow boring of hard boards. Well, the boards might as well be concrete when moral change is at stake. So I'm afraid that uh, I cannot offer optimism in the short run. But hope, hope is not the same as optimism and we can always have hope. extent you build political messages on them, you have a better chance of success than you would build on uh, the other It's not, it's not an absence of love any more than there's an absence of care. It's people love different things and people care about different things. Right, that's any, why we slip in the procedures. Right, but anything that we care about okay, in the contemporary world requires this network of institutions and systems that have to work properly. Uh, if uh, we're going to, uh, if the things we care about are going to survive, and so what I'm suggesting is it takes that kind of recognition, a recognition that we don't have, because we're caught up in this flawed conception of economy that I think uh, grounds a lot of our uh, system of value. Now, you're asking the question, what's the chances that we could uh, I don't know what the chances are. I'm not a, I'm not, I don't have a, uh, you know, a prediction about that. Uh, but I do think that, um, that um, appealing to motives that people actually have 
um, is uh, much more promising than appealing to motives that are very difficult for people. Well, that, that's why I was wondering, you kind of left out like Robert Trevor's notion that he came up with in the early 70s of reciprocal altruism, that that really is the foundation of people's you know, reactions on moral grounds. And um, I didn't see that where it would fit. Right, well, I take up this uh, occupies in part the last chapter of, of my book. Uh, and I think that reciprocal altruism is not sufficient um, um, because it requires uh, more than that, uh, actually, in order to make institutions work, in order to make our relationships uh, work. It requires more than reciprocal altruism. It, of course, requires, requires a kind of gratuitous generosity. And I think if you look at the most recent attempts to solve the prison dilemma problem using iterated prison dilemmas and computer models and so on, that's what this research is starting to show that um, you have to be willing not to, not to retaliate when somebody defects from the agreement, which require, in, order to, in order to succeed, in order to get the cooperation that you need. Yeah, it reminds me of the debate in the Chamber of Deputies in France over 100 years ago when people were arguing for uh, elements of mercy and whatnot, and people stood up and said, let the murderers be merciful first. Well, yeah, right, but uh, again, if, if if that's the way we think all the time about all of our institutions, then they're going to end up failing, I think, because, you know, people always, um, uh, people always uh, fail. Uh, it's just part of the human condition. Uh, people defect from agreements and so on. If you're always retaliating every time someone defects from an agreement, then the whole thing spirals downward. Maybe that, that recognition is what keeps people uh, having moderate feelings towards others. In order to not get burned. Which so what's the Watson test? Well, the biggest problem that uh, most people have is you're going to get cheated. Right. When you and you have to allow yourself to be occasionally cheated, and that's what the research in the prison well, shows. Well, that could be dangerous. Well, of course. So you got to be careful about when you allow yourself to be cheated. Obviously, in every circumstance, this is not some kind of you know hard and fast rule you follow. But mm -hmm. uh, but forgiveness, it looks like it's essential in solving the prison system. You have to be willing to forgive, sometimes, defection from agreements, okay? Otherwise, you just get this, because people always defect from agreements. That's just the way we are. And otherwise, you get this downward spiral of, uh, of retaliation, okay? Unless you're willing to sometimes, yeah. If it's just hit for tat, you get this downward spiral, okay? And so you have to have this sort of generosity sometimes in order to forgive uh, people defecting from agreements and so on. Now, all, 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 that has to be obvious limits. Magnanimity. Yeah, you have to have a kind of magnanimity. If, and, and that's not just reciprocal, you have to extend that to persons before you really know. Magnanimity isn't reciprocal. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's nature. Any other? Yeah. Well, I think of Tibet because you've got a, a group of people and a spiritual leader who absolutely believes and acts the way you're describing yes. here. And yet, <clears throat> once there are aggressors, that's right. The magnanimity, it just retreats and retreats sure. and retreats. They lose everything. They are horribly injured, horribly suffer. That's where I see the problem of this. Uh, it, in, the day-to-day -day, um, interaction between humans, we can exercise this. So why don't we get burned occasionally, right. or even terribly once in a while? But that, on that global scale, on that <coughs> scale, yeah, so once you're in a situation where it's essentially characterized by warfare, which is essentially that situation. Well, let's, let's take it, we can even just make it miniature, like somebody attacking your house because they want your house. You know? Well, the ethics of care certainly doesn't say that if someone attacks your kids, you can't defend them. Right. I mean, in fact, care requires, sometimes, aggression. It, it absolutely requires it. But then you're not acting with forgiveness and understanding. Well, but you can in that situation. And what you care about has to be defended. I mean, that's absolutely essential to the reasons of love. You can't allow someone to tear down what you love. That's incompatible with loving. So the Dalai Lama should have martial forces? Well, I, mean, uh, I don't think so. I think they'd be crushed. Yeah. Okay? I mean, Buddhist armed forces are not very good. No, they're not. Right? I understand that. Uh, I so I don't know what, I mean, I, I don't have a particular solution to the uh, problem of Tibet, aside from hoping that ultimately China will be willing to make some concessions, because it's going to take that. 
I don't mean to that specifically. I'm talking about the quality of the aggressor and the gentle person who is self-realized, magnanimous, willing to forgive, and yet there are always the aggressors. That's right. So you got it. How you, do you, just it, that, like the yin and the yang, I mean, forget the, the title of the Tibet and Buddhism and China. It's happening everywhere in the world. It's happened for thousands of years. How do we solve that issue? Well, I think there is a solution to that issue. You do? I, I said I don't think there's yeah. a solution to that issue. When someone's an aggressor, uh, then you have to protect what you care about. Uh, and I don't, you know, uh, I think that the best we can do is try to set up social systems such that people don't feel the need to be aggressors all the time. I mean, the problem is that when you set up a social system in which aggression gets paid off too much, then of course you're going to get lots of aggression. And so we need to de design social systems that, uh, that's why I said that policies that encourage trust and, uh, a, and minimize anger and fear and so on, those are policies that have the best chance of working in the long run to minimize uh, aggression because you know, typically people are aggressive when they're angry, afraid, mistrustful, right? So uh, trying to design institutions that don't encourage people to act this way seems to me to be the kind of thing that we ought to do. Now that's not easy. And uh, you know, I have some ideas I talk about in the, in the book a bit about you know, how we can conceptualize that. But again, uh, this is a long, long, hard slog. There's no easy answer to the question that you're posing. If there were an easy answer, we would have found it already. Right? Obviously, it's not that easy. Richard Rorty, uh, a philosopher, said, he's a line in one of his books, he says, it could just be that history is a boot stepping on a human throat forever. It could be. History is a pamphlet, and it's a there's, there's some good evidence of that, but you know, we do make progress. Yeah? Um, is it possible to have a for our political system, though, to overcome the self-interest of, you know, like the lobbyists and things like that, how do we how do we change that value system so that people are really focusing on what is best for our country versus what is best for whoever has that money? I mean, that's a hard question. I mean, I don't have a lot of answers to that aside from the required moral change. I mean, you know, what I'm arguing is that that kind of political change that you're looking for is going to require moral change. And so the question you're asking is, how does moral change take place? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, it, again, it takes a long time. That's why I said at the end, I'm not optimistic in the short run, uh, that we will. I mean, I think we've made very serious mistakes in this regard over the last 30, 40 years in trying to really emphasize inside that self-interest is, you know, is really a, a positive moral good. Uh, and once you get a culture that believes that, well, it's hard to root it out. Um, and it's going to take a long time, a lot of patience, in a matter of building institutions that don't emphasize self interest, but emphasize some other um, uh, motivation, in my view, uh, the act of care. Yeah? Um, how would you respond to a, Republic, um, a Republican remarking that you're trying to change America from its core values of? you know, more of everyone from themselves, and you're, you're changing America into something that is completely different and, and alien from what it was founded to be? Well, I mean, first of all, I think uh, history. <laughs> uh, you know, we've, we live under different conditions, certainly, than a lot of uh, that we used to in the uh, 18th and 19th century. Uh, I don't think that the core values of the United States, I don't think I'm suggesting that they change. I don't think the idea of autonomy and self-sufficiency is written in the Constitution. Okay? As far as I can tell, it isn't there. Uh, and uh, we had to, re you know, we had to adjust our institutions uh, and our political values to the conditions under which we live. We live in a, a highly interconnected, globalized world. We didn't live in that world before. So, as much as it might be admirable to think of the myth of the frontier as being the kind of um, ethic that we should all adopt. I mean, that might be admirable in the 19th century. I don't think we live in a frontier anymore. And so the idea of economic self-sufficiency doesn't make much sense. Okay? So, uh, you know, I would simply respond, you know, um, you know, join us in the 21st century. Yeah. I would also say that as a historian, 
the notion of the frontier individualism being uh, core to U.S. society, that there was no such thing as community, is not uh, realistic. All you have to do is go back to one of the most important founding statements at the time the colonies were established when John Winthrop preached a lay sermon uh, entitled A Model of Christian Charity. He talks about community and the duties that people have to one another, whether they're rich or they're poor. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the model of society that I embrace, but there certainly is a very strong principle there of charity that underpins the whole concept of the Massachusetts Bay Colony from 1631. <coughs> yeah, so it just depends on which, I, mean, I think Jonathan's right, it just depends on which uh, episodes from history you want to point to. You know, we tell narratives and we've, we're kind of selective about how we tell them. So you can tell one story about um, self-reliance, the myth of the frontier, and so on. You can tell another story about the sense of community, something that uh, de Tocqueville uh, you know, alluded to when he studied the United States back in the 19th century. Um, so uh, it just depends on which you know, history you want to tell, and there are alternative histories. Mike? Uh, Dwight, would you agree that, um, <clears throat> if we agree that, that there is a limit on care, there's only so much sure. care to be found in the world, and we treat that as an empirical fact, the fact of sociology, sure. but it's not. Uh, <clears throat> might that not help to account for the enduring popularity of the ethics of impartiality? In other words, once care runs out, at least we have principles of justice that can help largely with questions of distribution. Who gets what? Well, if people aren't going to care enough, or in the case of foreign policy, as in with Tibet, the Chinese just can't be made to care sufficiently for their little neighbor, but they, we feel they ought to. <clears throat> Isn't it nice to think that when you have rules of liberty and, 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 and some kinds of equality uh, that are another independent criterion, they will be sufficient to handle a lot of distribution-like questions when, as, as presumably we've agreed, uh, there just isn't sufficient care to generate a decent result otherwise. Well, but I don't think the, the, the rules that you get from this impartial point of view, I don't think they are sufficient. I mean, they, they may be sufficient as rules, and they may be interesting and sufficient as a philosophical perspective, but I just don't think they tap into our motivational states. Uh, so in the end, I don't, I mean, I think as a society, we've always had this notion that equality is our fundamental value. I don't think we come close to satisfying. Every once in a while, we inch towards it. But we don't come close, even though this has been a central aspect of liberal theory you know, for centuries. Um, and uh, so I don't think that this sort of impartial perspective, I mean, I don't think people really reason that way. It doesn't appeal to lots of people. That is not to say that equality isn't a valuable notion. It is. But it's got to be connected to our motivational states. Uh, and that's why I think the ethics of care is important. I think you get notions of equality and fairness out of the ethics of care. Now it's not, I mean, it, it takes some, some work to do that, okay? But I think in the end, um, from a philosophical point of view, that that's the way to go. To see questions of equality and fairness emerging out of our concern for the things that we love and the things we care about. Uh, and recognition that there has to be a system of fairness if these um, motives are, if we're gonna be able to exercise these motives in our lives. <coughs> So I don't have, I mean, I don't have a real problem with sort of, um, with the kind of uh, intellectual framework of, you know, these impartial rules and so on. It's not that they're incoherent, uh, you know, they're not incoherent at all. They've been um, an important ideal and so on. But until you grab the motivational states of people, you can't implement them. Uh, and I think that's the problem. Uh, so, just focusing on your first proposition up there, uh, it appears that the main challenge uh, for contemporary liberals is to reformulate their message so, so as uh, to allow ordinary people to realize that what they care about in their lives yes. is dependent upon broader issues. That's right. So, how would you suggest that contemporary liberals go about reformulating their message to achieve this? Start reforming the need. I mean, you know, I mean, the information we get from the mainstream media is not particularly good on issues like this. Uh, and that's, that's a big problem. 
Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not, certainly not an expert on political messaging. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I haven't thought too much about how you actually develop a political <coughs> message around this. I mean, I think that liberals from time to time try. I mean, I hear allusions to this sort of thing in a lot of uh, President Obama's speeches and so on. Uh, so so I, I think it's a matter of political messaging. Um, you know, I think sometimes liberals do okay in tapping, tapping into the motivational states of people. Right? The problem is that when they begin to govern, then you get this sort of interest group proceduralism taking over. So, I mean, I, I think if I had a, a, a generally <coughs> proof of the Obama administration and what they, what they do, but if they, he made one mistake, I think, it's not really carrying through that grassroots organization that he had to win the election. As soon as he got to Washington, it was the inside game. There was no attempt to show that, that that inside game had some relevance to people's lives. And that's why now uh, you know, it, it, he's looking you know, unpopular because he turned to that sort of inside interest group game instead of maintaining his connection to a kind of grassroots peer. So I think the messages are OK. The problem is that the problem of governance, the problem is that because liberalism aims at this impartial conversation, it becomes, they get, become really caught up in developing these procedures. Uh, and uh, they lose sight of what the end is. The, end, the procedures become an end in themselves. I'm just wondering uh, how we might go about getting this uh, reformulated message or, or liberal message that puts more emphasis on, on the ethics of care and how that relates to social policy how to actually get that out to the general public. I agree with you. I think Obama, on occasion, you know, has formulated a perspective right along you know, the line that you're proposing. Uh, but it seems like few people are hearing it. Uh, and I do blame the, the media, by and large. Uh, but how do we then change the media so that television, news commentators, whoever, you know, point this out, that what we care about in our personal lives is dependent upon these broader social issues, problems, and how do we change the media? I mean, there's a lot of political science in here. I have to say about that. I, I'm not sure how to change the media. Uh, Sam's a, you know, yeah. um, When you say liberalism, I'm not sure. You mean concept of liberalism and general theoretical philosophy, or you mean liberalism as we practice in America? Because our liberalism is considered by other political philosophers and other societies conservative liberalism. Right. It's very limited by corporate capitalist market economy. So when conservatives are in power, are very clear what they want. Reagan was in power. Anything he didn't like, he said, the guest on my desk will be dead on arrival. I'll be to it. Mm -hmm. Obama never said, if this healthcare bill gets to my desk, doesn't have public option, I'm going to be to it. Right. No. So the night before Christmas, everybody was shopping. They took the public option out. <laughs> and then what we got is that whatever exactly the insurance companies wanted right. after one year of discussion. Yes, sir. So many people look at this and say this is fake liberalism. It's not real liberalism. Mm -hmm. Real liberalism in Europe, other places have moved to the left and has taken care of all those issues that you're talking about. Well, so, right, so, care so I'm arguing that, that uh, to some degree, Obama and his administration are caught up in this notion of proceduralism with liberalism, okay, which is a kind of conservative liberalism. Okay? Because it's concerned with procedures, it's not concerned so much with outcomes and so on. But that's to some extent. The, right. the reality is that structurally, the, the liberals, liberals in America are not real liberals. They have been pushed well, to the right rather than pushed to the left. Again, I mean, the reason I went through all of that sort of liberal theory earlier is to see that is to try to show that this is baked in to liberal political philosophy. This idea of trying to get all these interests together in a conversation and get them to adopt an impartial point of view and then come up with some account of what we ought to pursue some set of procedures that allow us to pursue that. And that's baked into the very idea of liberalism. I think that's the problem. Okay? So I, I agree with you there are different liberalisms, and the word is, is understood differently in different parts of the world and in different uh, times as well. Uh, when I use the word in the political context, I just kind of mean the ordinary way we, we talk about uh, the sort of left wing of the Democratic Party. Okay? When I talk about procedural liberals, then I'm talking about more the centrist view, because I think that's largely procedural. Okay? I think the left wing of the Democratic Party does have a sense of where we're headed and are impatient with procedures and so on. But I don't think they have a very strong voice. I think it's the centrists who end up winning out. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's a problem. Ian. Yeah. 
Yes. So a uh, question about the kind of ethic of care as a, as a foundation. Um, it seems to be one of the features of care and, and, of, and of love is that um, you care for people, you love people who are similar to you, and the flip side of that is you dislike or, or there's even a kind of a hate uh, uh, of people who are different. It's kind of tribalism involved there. And so how does that, how do you get that to work in the kind of pluralistic society that we have? And, and just thinking about some of the European liberal uh, democracies, they have a real problem with um, uh, uh, foreigners and, and people who are not sort of of that uh, uh, um, of that region coming in, and, and, and there's been some fairly uh, strong reactions against that. So, so I, I guess I'm just sort of curious about that problem and then how to right. Well, I mean that's a deep question about the ethics of care, and the way that I try to work this out on kind of theoretical level is that I, I end up arguing that um, when you meet any other person, when you're in contact with another person, another human being, um, that part of that motivational structure that identifies the reasons of love and so on um, is inherent in that relationship. So that all relationships have a component of care built into them. If they didn't, I mean, think about the importance of trust, for instance, in any human relationship. If you're just walking down the street and you pass somebody on the street, you think that you have no relationship, and that's not true. You're absolutely dependent on them not trying to kill you or, or rob you or something. And you're not, if you think they're going to try to kill you or rob you, you're not going to walk past them. So even a perfunctory <coughs> encounter, if you think of the phenomenology of that fun, uh, perfunctory encounter, involves <coughs> notions of care, or, and or at least mutual responsibility and trust and so on. So there's a kind of minimal notion of care there. Now it isn't the expansive notion of care that one talks about when you're dealing with your kids. But there is a level, you know, you have to, to some degree, if you're going to function in society, you have to have a certain level of care and responsibility for anybody you encounter. Okay? So um, it seems to me that that phenomenology at least can overcome uh, the kinds of um, um, oppositional identities and so on that you were talking about. Uh, because any human person you encounter uh, involves the recognition that this person is another person who you fundamentally can't control, who doesn't belong to you. Uh, so this notion of mutual respect, it seems to me, comes right out of the structure of any human relationship. You don't need an impartial principle to get there. Uh, all you need to do is pay attention to the encounter itself. So I try to build a notion of uh, a universal ethic out of very particularistic encounters without appeal to an impartial principle. I mean, so that's the sort of philosophical answer to you. Right. I mean, the only thing, and maybe this is just, you know, but I mean, you know, you'll have people who, you know, they see a person of a certain race walking down the street and they'll cross the street sure. because, so, but I mean, that's just, you know, some people are. are well, sure, we have bad habits. habits. Uh, sometimes, I mean, in some cases, in some neighborhoods, that's not a bad habit. Right. In some neighborhoods, that's a good habit. So this is a very, con you know, I, uh, the thing I want to emphasize with ethics of care is that it's very context dependent. Okay? You don't act on a principle. You have to pay attention to what's going on in your situation. You have to, to, to uh, affect an ethics of care. You have to be really um, alive to what's going on in your situation in the present moment okay? in order to do the right thing. Uh, because it is a matter of judgment in very complex circumstances. Your ability to make the right judgment in those circumstances. That's inherent in the ethics of care. That's why they reject general principles, because they don't think that general principles are sufficient to cover the variety of different circumstances that we confront in our lives every day. So I think it's not, it's, it's inappropriate to understand the ethics of care as if it were based on principles. So there's some kind of principle of care that you're supposed to activate all the time. It depends on the circumstances. Yeah. Uh, when you think of how far the word care, that's the word we use in English, sorga is uh, the word uh, Heidegger used just in being in time, uh, has traveled since uh, 1928 or so. Uh, are you worried, as I am, that the overuse of this term and uh, what might be called the sloppiness of some of its application or potential application 
can actually uh, lead people to have more confidence in powerful subjective feelings than uh, moral people really want. I mean, Heidegger's the ethics of care, if you will, he didn't exactly speak that way, but uh, you know, was comfortable with German fascism for at least a few months right. or four years. But we don't know. Uh, that's a worry to, I think, somebody who was, believes in traditional, <laughs> you know, Rawlsian type principles. That's, that's a very complicated question. There's a little bit of ad hominem in there, but, <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 first of all, uh, yeah, that part of it. Right. Uh, there's some debate about what the connection is between Heidegger's philosophy and his political attachments. Uh, and of course, and this is still going on, it's just a book that came out about a year ago that dredges all this up again. And so it was a big debate in the blogosphere for a while. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what to say about that. It seems to me Heidegger's conception of care is not the same as the ethics of care. It's a different use of the term. There are connections in one of these days. I'd like to trace those connections out, but I haven't sat down to do that yet. Uh, so I don't think it's completely um, two different ballparks here, but um, but it's not the same notion. I mean, Heidegger doesn't think care as a motive. I'm thinking of care as, as a motive uh, and an attitude and a practice, whereas for him it's a kind of ontological principle. Right. Um, so, so I'm not quite using the word care in the same way that, that he is. Okay. Now, as to the notion of emotions playing too large a role, um, I mean, again, it comes down to judgment. Uh, you know, sometimes you want emotions to play a large role in some contexts, in some contexts you don't. Sometimes emotions get in the way, but sometimes emotions report accurate things about the world that you need to know. Uh, so people who suppress their emotions all the time are not particularly knowledgeable about how the world works. They don't, they, they're not able to engage in people, with people in the appropriate way. So our emotions have to be obviously regulated by our capacity for judgment. Um, and that's you know, why one of the things I emphasize with ethics of care is this capacity for judgment that's absolutely essential. You have to know when deploying emotion is a good thing and when it isn't. Um, now, the ethics of care, the reasons of love here are not just, it's not just about emotions. It's about uh, the, uh, remember I said that the care has to, to be genuine, it has to appeal to an independent standard. And there's a question, whenever you engage in an action that's motivated by care, it is only going to satisfy those conditions when you actually do some good for the person you care for. If you care for somebody, you have an attitude of care for them, and you just continue to damage them in some way. Well, you don't really care. You don't, you don't have the practice of care. You might have the attitude. But you don't have the virtue of care or the practice of care. Okay? Um, so it's not all just about emotion. It is, it is connected to emotion. It's not just about that. It's about using good judgment and understanding what the needs are of the things you care about. So I would want to claim, if you don't understand the needs of the things you care about, to my mind, you, 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 you don't have full level of care. You have a kind of, you, you know, a kind of ersatz version of it. Yeah? I just had a question on where you separate care and self-interest. Yeah. The more I care, the more I see that you get more self-interested. And Taking that to politics, I think that uh, if you uh, liberalists were to uh, focus on self-interest groups where they have and can exploit their care, whereas other self-interest parties exploit, say, their profit, pocket like or capitalism, um, a leader who could balance the care of the urban could probably solve a lot of problems. I, 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 I think I agree. I mean, when you started your question, you were really on a good point. Okay, I think you're asking, what, what's the difference between care and self-interest? Right? Is that what you're asking? That's a really good question. I mean, that's an absolutely fundamental question. And the difference is this: um, there's a sense in which, when you care for someone, for instance, okay, your interests merge with the interests of the person you care for. You take up their interests. And that becomes your interest. Okay? However, the difference is this. It's that independent standard that I was talking about before. When you care for someone, 
if you have genuine care, that their welfare is the independent standard that determines what you do. Right? Now, you might identify your interest in Independent of your welfare. Well, it, it, sometimes it may be, sometimes not. Sometimes, I mean, uh, what I'm arguing here is that usually our own interest is the same as the interest of the things that we care for. Why would, why would we care for them? What about the welfare of the others who aren't within that sphere? Right, okay. so you're going to end up getting conflicts there. Uh, there's, there, is no, there is no life without conflict. Okay? And there is no easy moral perspective that doesn't involve conflicts between things we care about. Okay? And these are all going to involve judgment. So you're right that there could be conflict between uh, expressing care for a person, for instance, and having care for these sort of other larger social structures that do matter to us, but in some particular case, there may be a conflict there. So you have to use judgment to determine you know, what you care about most, and what you ought to do. I mean, if, if, you, uh, if you try to enhance or, or uh, benefit the well-being of someone you care for, and because of your inattention, to the larger context in which you act, you end up undermining their interests, then you don't have genuine care. Okay? You, because there's, there's a lack of understanding about the, what the needs of the cared for person are. So that there's a kind of epistemic component here. Uh, that is, to care for someone is to have knowledge of their real needs. Does that help? It just it, it didn't touch on the difference between self interest. Well, you start to and, care, well, there is self interest. The, 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 your your self interest merges with the things you care for. You, you, in, a, in a sense, they, there's a sense in which they become you. In a sense, and there's a sense in which who you are. If you think about what your identity is. Well, it's really made up of the things you care about. If you put together all the things you care about uh, in a sort of complex way, we do. Um, You've gone a long way to describing what your own identity is. It's the things you care about. So there, there is a, a merging of it. So care isn't opposed to your self-interest. It's a merging of self-interest. How is the liberal party or political organization supposed to merge their cares in order to get anything done? Well, I mean, in politics, we're concerned uh, with social systems, institutions, and so on. Right? And again, you're going to have to make difficult political decisions about, you know, whose interests um, you're going to serve and whose you're not. Okay. And what I'm arguing, excuse me, part of what I'm arguing here is that to make sense of this, you've got to have a conception of the good. You have to have a sense of what you're aiming at here, not just a set of procedures that adjudicate conflict, but you need a conception of what a good life is. And it seems to me you can't avoid that. There's no such thing as a, a neutral government, a government that doesn't pick and choose between you know, what you're going to support and what you're not going to support. It seems to me that, for instance, um, you know, if on the gay marriage issue, if the government decides to make gay marriages, then that is endorsing, to some degree, gay marriage. Uh, and if it decides not to endorse it, then it's, you know, it's endorsing the illegitimacy of gay marriage. And there isn't any neutral position. Right? You're, you know, you're choosing a conception of the good when you make that judgment. So there isn't any neutral position. You're going to have to make decisions about what to promote and what not to promote. And hopefully, uh, if your perspective is driven by care, for those interests that don't get served, you still have a concern for their welfare. Um, you know, because that's going to be important to build trust in society. And you've got these competing concerns. Right? So you just can't run roughshod over. Okay? Because that undermines trust. We all need trust. Social trust is essential to society. We all need it, so uh, you've got to pick and choose what interests you serve, but at the same time realize that you can't go too far undermining the kind of social trust that all of us depend on. Okay? So again, there's no, you know, there, there's no, there's no fence to occupy. Uh, I think that liberalism has to choose the conception of the good life and promote it. So, I'm trying to just figure out whether or not, you know, when you, your ethics of care, whether or to what extent it still remains fairly individualistic in this sense. It seems to me that, you know, if we revise autonomy away from self-sufficiency, 
and we try to incorporate the network of others, you know, mm -hmm. involved in that. And this relationship to self-realization mm -hmm. that we now have to bring back in that notion of the community. In other words, it's not just what we immediately care for, oh, it's sure. also the larger community. Absolutely. And so, in other words, it would seem that our care has to be, it perhaps start locally, right, but then extend itself right. out to the community. That's right. And uh, and our own our own sense of self, or our, what we think of as realization of ourselves, would also then be tied I to those right. communal that's networks, right. right? I think one of the virtues of the ethics of care is it's not incompatible with self interest. I think if the, the impartial point of view is that they had those two models of, of agency on the board. You got self interest, and then you got impartiality. And if you're being impartial, obviously you're not being self interested. With the ethics of care. The, our motives merge so that uh, there is the self is involved in the, in the interest of the self is involved in what we care about. But it's simply you take a sort of larger, you have a larger sense of the kinds of concerns you have to have uh, in order to serve what you care about. So it, it, uh, I have no interest in, in trying to uh, uh, devalue the notion of autonomy as a central, central value. That's why I still call this a form of liberalism. Because I do think autonomy is central to it. Uh, and I have really no interest. I certainly don't want to argue that self-interest is a bad thing. We'd be in trouble. Uh, we wouldn't survive very long unless we were able to take our interests into account. Right? So I have no, I don't want to try to, I'm not arguing for some kind of super altruism here. Right. I'm simply saying that, look, your interests are broader than what you think. Well, there's no basic incompatibility between self-interest and the interest of the community. Not necessarily. There might be in particular circumstances, and that's where your judgment comes in. But yes, you're right. The, your interests and the interests of the community are not distinctly different. Don't. You made mention several times about these conflicts of care. Yep. Can, can it go as high as tragedy? Absolutely. In other words, Absolutely. You know, as Hegel maintained the tragedy, it's when right clashes with right. Yep. Yep. So. That's in the nature of love. You can love incompatible things. <clears throat> and there may not be a solution. <clears throat> There are ways of dealing with tragic conflict. You can't always do it. I don't think uh, Sophie and Sophie's Choice had a way out. Mm -hmm. But there are some tragic conflicts that we that we are able to work through. Well, so for instance, I say healthcare. I could see people wanting to, you know, help anonymous people. But there's a lot of people who realize that a lot of people who need the care have self-inflicted problems. They drink. They smoke. <coughs> take drugs, they don't exercise, they're obese, they eat the wrong things, then why should people who do take care of themselves be uh, uh, forced to take care of people who will not do what the people who care already do? Why shouldn't they? I think of a couple reasons why. Well, because there's maybe, uh, there's not a surplus of things we can care for. And so maybe we'll direct our attention to things that are much more efficient. Sure, we have to make decisions about what to put resources into. Right. In other words, you know, we get around, we're dancing around moral rationalism here closely. Uh, that we might very reasonably differ severely about what it is to care about. And so the impasse. Well, well what I'm arguing is that, you know, it seems to me what's irrational is thinking that those other people out there who are unhealthy because they don't have health care or something, thinking that they don't affect you. Well, they're, they're not unhealthy because they don't. It doesn't have matter what the reason is. To my mind, it doesn't smoke, matter. They drink, they take well, drugs. Yeah. But, 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 but that, again, that's an autonomous choice they made. It point. is, but their ill health still harms people. It still harms people. Well, it doesn't people. harm other people because they've gone out of their way to not succumb to temptation. No. So, it increases our health costs. It has all kinds of impacts on the rest of us. And we have, when you have a lot of people without health care, then you have a social system that doesn't work, that has high levels of mistrust. There's all kinds of problems that are associated with and society. And mistrust is well-founded. Well, mistrust is, is well-founded in what sense? A number of citizens mistrust other citizens because they are not thinking of long-term consequences of the choices they make in life. Whereas a lot of uh, thoughtful people do think 
go on to be so Well, there are a couple things you can do. You can build incentives into your healthcare system that encourages people to take better care of themselves. Um, I think that's one of the proposals. Don't take care of them. Pardon me? Don't take care of them. Well, that doesn't work because people, you, you, you know, if, if, uh, people are inclined to not take care of themselves anyway, regardless of whether you beat them or not. I don't think, I mean, it seems to me that that, that, uh, that perspective that you're developing there is this notion that, look, if you just beat on people hard enough, you'll improve them. And I just think that's all. I think we have so much of your relevance. You won't improve them, but you'll just oh. save money. So you, went, oh, so you end up with a bunch of people. Because that might be when somebody cares about it. Okay, so. save their tax money for something Right, else. so now when they get sick, they come to the emergency room, you've got to pay for them anyway. The alternative is, no, let's not pay no, for certain, them. Just, let them, just let them die in the streets. And then we've got, you know, two choices. We can have either the society that we want, or we've got Haiti. Which do you want? It seems to me the society you're describing is a banana republic. People lying in the streets, um, you just kind of walk over them, you don't care. Well, we care, but, you know, care <laughs> is reciprocal. Yeah. You've got to have people who want to meet that. I don't think it's reciprocal, but I think it's... That, that goes back to the behavior. This uh, leads to people taking advantage of well, systems. This goes back to this we had this discussion. This is back to tip for tat, and I don't think it works. Yeah, I just you know, I am a political scientist, so I am interested in the question of the message, right? Yes. And so I was you know, I had some messages in my head and one message was um, because we care, Medicare. Right? Now see, that works. Right? That works, because you can imagine, I care about my grandmother, right? And then you move on to, because we care, Medicaid. Well, that's a little harder to sell. It's because it doesn't rhyme as well. It doesn't rhyme as well, that, definitely. That's why they called it Medicare, right? Because we care because financial we regulation. Medicaid. How about because we care financial regulation, right? Again, mm -hmm. And I guess the point, the, the question I, I have is about something you said earlier about you have to have a certain level of knowledge yep. of the effects of these things, right. right? People don't have a level of knowledge about how financial regulation That's right. affects them. That's good. And so, uh, and so, I guess, well, you can talk about that. But my other question is how do you, and then you start talking about choice architecture, right? Building in incentives. Yes. So that people make better choices and stuff. Yeah. How far do we take that kind yeah, of no, rationale? This, this is a good question. This is absolutely a central problem that I don't have an answer for. Right. The problem is that supposedly this is democracy. We want people, uh, we want uh, pe people themselves to make decisions uh, that you know about how we are to govern ourselves and so on. At the same time, we live in an enormously complicated society in which the level of knowledge you need to figure out what good policies are is way beyond either you know, the capacity of ordinary people to grasp it. Or even very smart people with it, all kinds of backgrounds. Absolutely. They, there's no way they can penetrate it. That's right, absolutely. I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is. I really don't know. It's, this has kept me up a couple nights. Uh, I knew I was going to get this question. Okay, and a couple nights ago, I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning thinking about this. Um, you know, um, how do you get this, this knowledge? Uh, how are we to understand what the real needs of people what the, uh, Especially just, in a situation in which the media is becoming even more fragmented. Yeah, the media is fragmented, and frankly, the media is not concerned to inform people. It's, it has a different name. The media, right. the aim of the media is to make money. Right. Uh, it's not to inform people, and it's, you know, yes. it's really not doing either one now uh, yeah. so well. But um, so this, this is a real problem. It goes back to that this, this debate we're going to start having now, and it's going to get worse between the sort of grassroots anger and the elites. Right? I mean, it comes back to that, uh, that, that, that question of, you know, these elites have this knowledge and they got us into all this trouble, and so why are we listening to these people? Well, we got to listen to them because otherwise we have no clue what to do. We, you know, we have some knowledge of what to do, and we have to listen to people who have that kind of knowledge. Um, so this is a, this is a, a big problem, and uh, it's endemic to modern societies. The more complex the society becomes, the more this becomes a problem. Uh, and I think that the standard answer that we've had for years. And, and that, well, in a sense, the more democratic autonomy becomes disposable. Disposable, yeah. 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 And the answer that we've had to this all along is that, well, more education. Mm -hmm. well, that's true. <laughs> that's, right. That is an adequate. That hasn't worked. That doesn't work. <laughs> uh, you know, it would in an ideal educational system, which is not the one we have or the one that's coming. But um, we don't want less. 
Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> They're trying to make them. They are. They are. So I don't, this is a central problem, Michelle, and I don't, I don't know what to say. Yeah. Well, you know, all of these are conflicts. Yeah. And the founding fathers, when they created the new constitution in 1787, uh, first of all, they cared uh, of the situation that was going on around them. So uh, they put in all of these structures, these institutions, uh, with powers and limitations, OK? Um, and then four years later, they add on uh, the 10 amendments. Right. OK, and the first amendment you have a right to assemble. Yeah. And you are protected in pluralism, all right? So when we're exercising politics, um, that means everybody who has conflicting ideas uh, are going to try to continually um, influence the politicians right. and get and support them and see to it that they get them into the very strongest political positions where they can make legislations and laws um, that will benefit them. Uh, they're caring. Those are each of them have care, right? Okay, and their laws that come out of this are a reflection of their care. Okay, so one of these laws Getting to your uh, question relevant to uh, gay marriage, um, individuals and states, uh, some states have made uh, their caring uh, reflections through their propositions or laws, uh, how they feel about this. However, uh, we also have nationally the 14th Amendment, which, would, which actually uh, settles the situation. Yes because of the uh, equal protection of law, okay? So that is also a, a, a result of care. That is a result of, of care of the Congress way back in 1868, uh, not thinking about gay marriage for sure. <laughs> they were just worried about reconstruction and reparation and all kinds of things and states were going and to stop states supposedly uh, through this uh, from persecution and discrimination of blacks, etc. Okay, so actually these processes exist. Sure. Okay, um, and and protect the the different groups who care uh, as conservatives in very narrow, in the inclusive, not inclusive right. in their care. And the, the so-called liberals here in the United States, the Democrats, supposedly, uh, who are uh, impartial, you're saying. Uh, that impartiality is also in, in, is inclusive, however. Is right. that not caring? Well, I mean, I think that inclusiveness, yes. Uh, so I don't see how you can be impartial and care at the same time. It seems to be Why? If you're because inclusive, if, if your whole foundation is about inclusion. Yeah, but it seems to me that our, the Look motive. Look at the care law. It, it's all about including everybody, isn't it? The whole, the public, it's a public option. Everybody has a chance. That's inclusion, is it not? Right. And that's caring, isn't it? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, it seems to me that. Well, um, uh, if you use the word care, it's something, it's loving. Isn't it being more loving? Well, that's what I think drives considerations about gay marriage and so on, is the fact that... Well, impossible, impossible. Right. Now, uh, you know, I but, think that... But uh, that's what I'm, you know, all of these things, <laughs> getting to the impartial concept and getting to the care concept, and that they can't possibly work together or, or, or they conflict... Well, I'm not going to say they don't work together. I mean, it's sometimes you arrive at the same place, okay? That is, you can justify, say, um, a, the legal, uh, making gay marriage legal from an impartial point of view. You can provide an impartial account of why we ought to do that. Right, because or we you, have a law that right, was made. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, or you can defend it from the standpoint of care. 
Well. Okay. What I'm arguing is that um, so the two, the two ways of sort of defending that policy, right? And what I'm suggesting is that the impartial point of view doesn't tap into our motivational resources in the way that um, the reasons of love do or care do. Okay. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a 14th Amendment out there that does seem to prescribe a kind of impartial approach here. Yes. I agree. Right. I right. Agree. And it, it also, it, it, in, in being impartial, it says inclusion, right? That 14th Amendment, well, when it says protection, equal protection of the law. Yeah, but it seems to me, uh, when you say inclusion, um, it, it, says, it says no person shall be denied equal protection under the law. Right. Okay. That's, That's right. the last statement in Section 1 mm -hmm. of, the, of the Constitution. Right. Of the of uh, of um, uh, the Fourteenth Amendment right. in the section one, it says no, no person. person. It doesn't say no conception of the good or something like that. It says no person as an individual. Well, well, they're talking about a person definitely. They said no state. It begins said the the, the 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 whole clause with no state shall deny, and it goes on to say uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, through the due process of law, and then the next, uh, the last part of the clause says, "No person shall be denied equal protection of the law." That's a very caring statement that uh, shows, I think, impartiality. Uh, you know, and, well, and especially yeah. through the, uh, you know, uh, interpretations from the Supreme Court, etc., uh, again and again and again. But that. I but think I think a lot of laws that we have are motivated by caring. That's why I said it's a, well, it's yeah, a, right. it's a central motive. I, don't, I, just, uh, I agree totally with you. That we act on that. all the time. Yeah. My problem has to do with the sort of theoretical framework of liberalism often works against that. Okay. Uh, because it ends up in this kind of empty proceduralism that I talked about where, uh, you know, where, it, uh, where there's no particular conception of what a good life is that's being promoted. It's simply, you know, these rules are in place. Um, and things have been, been decided, and we've got to follow these, however the interpretation you know, comes out. I mean, it seems so to me that you, the motivation what for you what... Then, uh, what do you uh, suggest? Well, the, the motive behind... In a democracy, if you don't follow procedures... Well, I, I'm not saying that no procedures... I, I, we need procedures. Right. But it seems to me the aim of uh, political discourse isn't just to come up with procedures. No, of course it's, not. The aim is a particular kind of life. Absolutely, I agree with Well, you. but I, I don't think theoretical liberalism recognizes that. It isn't, I mean, until very recently, when you start to get this coming into play with some of the things that uh, Nussbaum and Martin Sen and maybe Michael Walzer and some more recent theorists of liberalism, they're starting to inter uh, uh, introduce uh, notions of what counts as a good life into their view. But this hasn't been traditional in, in liberalism. Uh, and uh, yeah, and right. so when the aim becomes just the rules and procedures, and they're not just a means to a good life, but become ends in themselves, then I think you run into this kind of empty proceduralism. Mm -hmm. So to go back to the gay marriage thing, you've got the 14th Amendment. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a terribly powerful argument for most people. But well, for most people, the argument is that no, I right. have gay friends, I don't see why they shouldn't be married, or my uh, pastor says that it's a sin, and so they shouldn't be married. Right. Okay? Right. Uh, the 14th Amendment to death. Yes. But what is it? Now it matters to the political process that there is a 14th Amendment. And and right, and the legal process. And the legal process. But for most of the people, that's just this uh, alien yeah. thing that happens up there. Well, it's getting back to what um, uh, she said about uh, people be, not having any knowledge. Yeah, that's right. That's the problem. Okay, and, they, and uh, so therefore, others who are uh, take advantage of that mm -hmm. uh, become very powerful, mm -hmm. and they they become the old carpet. Right. But I think that the 14th Amendment, once you interpret it as meaning that gay marriage is permitted, you're well, no longer being neutral there. It means, it doesn't mean, it didn't, doesn't mean that gay marriage is, but it means that you can't discriminate against one group and say another group can't. I understand. That's so if you interpret that as permitting gay marriage, then you're no longer, the state is no longer neutral between different conceptions of the good as saying that we think that gay marriage is something that's... Uh, at least uh, how, how do you how do you interpret that that it's saying that the, that the state because is you, no longer neutral when the state has a law a law in is there because you can't avoid the question of whether gay marriage is a good thing or not that question is central 
you know, well, the gay marriage, uh, the that is more uh, that is more of a more of a religious issue. Well, isn't it? I, I don't. For me, it's not. No, it's not. A religious no, no, no. Issue. But maybe not for you. Maybe not for me. But for some those people, who argue, right, who yeah. argue against it, it is a religious I issue. Agree. Whereas the state uh, should be impartial. Well, <laughs> I don't think That's the state can be impartial. Laws. I think the state is always making decisions about what's good and what's bad. Well, I think we need to acknowledge that, that when you make decisions that, you know, that yeah. begins to articulate a conception of the good. Well, yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, just to sort of follow up on that, I, I think though, especially with a lot of people say who would be opposed to gay marriage, they can explain that opposition in terms of, you know, why am I opposed, the government shouldn't do this, because then it's forcing a particular conception yeah. of how to live on me. Right, and it's violent. You know, for gay marriage to be legal is to violate my First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. um, well, you have state states can do that, uh, right? But then states, if they do that, which some of them are, and the state did, it, and yeah. it's now in the appellate federal court, right? Or in the, in the district um, federal court right now. But that that's a conflicting um, care <laughs> uh, in a law. Uh, in the state versus the national law, which is supreme over a state law. And therefore, there's the conflict. Again, a conflict, state law versus national law. And so there we go again. We have a conflict there of a, from a law like you're, you just suggested. You can a, a express your you know, dislike and think it's inappropriate that gays marry in a law. But look, I, I think I'll give you, I see your hand, Scott. And, I just want to, it seems to me that um, there is the neutral answer. If, if you think that the state ought to be neutral, yeah, right. the neutral answer to this issue is to say, well, then uh, the state no longer is, is going to be in the marriage yeah, business right. at all. Yeah, you simply allow people to have um, you know, yeah, uh, a, a civil ceremony that doesn't count as marriage, but we're going to call it uh, something else. But uh, states and, under our Constitution have the right, the only right, to give licenses for marriage. Right. Yeah. So you take so you take the word marriage out there and simply say civil unions. Yeah. That's what the state is involved. In. That's the neutral answer. I don't like that answer. I'm married, uh, and it's not a religious thing. I, I'm married, and I like right. being married, and yeah. I think marriage is important. I think it's good for society, yeah. uh, and so yeah. I don't like the civil union idea. I think the state should choose. You know, either gay marriage is good, marriage is good, and gay marriage is good, or it isn't. It's another uh, conflict issue. Pardon me. The, what you're saying is another conflict issue, of isn't it? Yeah. But I don't think the state really can be neutral about this. I think at the end of the day, the state's choosing. Scott? Um, getting back to this question of how do we inform the public so that we can make better choices, yeah. um, I, I'm reminded of our, our ballot process where you've got, you know, the ballot comes, you've got the pro argument and the con right. argument, and I find generally that both of those are uh, devious and misleading. Right, not and, helpful. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> and so what you have to do is you have to read the legislative analysts, yeah. you know, so maybe what we need to do as a society is, is, is to start being serious about having clearing houses for information from neutral parties. And you know maybe the internet could help here, but if you could have... Who's the neutral party? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's the problem. There really are reliable sources for information. We just don't get them anymore. Um, but I'm thinking of the, you know, the consumer reports kind of information, and I realize even they are not completely unbiased, but. Uh, there are sources I trust and, and sources I don't trust, and more lately it's, it's the latter. Right. Uh, and so, if you could have foundations that were willing, you know, and, and um, um, yeah, non interested parties fund the creation of clearing houses for neutral information that would eventually develop some trust so that people would refer to them. Um, that might be something we could do, rather than relying on the media, where no, I, I, generally the media is just useless. Oh, I agree. I agree. The model of you know the media being essentially a profit-driven um, you know, institution, I don't think that works, uh, and it's not working pretty clearly. I think that's right. Um, now, whether I mean, it's, it's still a problem how you come up with these, these neutral institutions that um, you know. But I, I yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic to your to your idea. I, you know, that, uh, I mean, it seems to me that um, compared to our media, the BBC is a lot better. Now, some people would, of course, in Britain, they have a lot of complaints about the BBC as 
well. Uh, but to, to my mind, you get better information from them than you do from any of our media. Yeah. And that's kind of a neutral body. I mean, it's, it's supported by the government, but it's also independent. The government doesn't exercise editorial control over it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that model is probably yeah. better than the I mean, and Just to say that, that, that it's possible, and then certainly we can do better. Yeah, oh, I agree. Better. No, I, no, I agree. I'm just just that that you know, useful information. But. Opening's already spoken on this issue anyway. We're not about ready to do any heavy lifting mentally. We've already given up on true news that people turn away from it in droves and go to entertainment tonight because that is the only news they care about. So the consumer ultimately has rejected any heavy lifting that Scott would like to do when going back to studying the uh, underlying issues. Well, but there's, there's a way in which to go back to Scott's point, there is, there is a way in which, through the back door, you may end up getting a news media that is reliable. Uh, I mean, most newspapers are failing, uh, and I don't, see, I, don't, I don't see a business model out there for me. Uh, a lot of people now are talking about making academic institutions the source of news. Schools that have uh, journalism departments um, will run news sites, and their students will engage in practice of journalism and so on. Um, that may be a way in which you begin to get, just because there's no other alternatives, it, it's, of course there's a problem that academic institutions are also underfunded now, and so how are they going to take on this additional burden? That's a whole other problem. But um, if you can't support newspapers through um, um, advertising, and through the profit model, there may be some backdoor way of getting um, news institutions located someplace else. But I don't know. I mean, it seems to me that's problematic as possible. The supply of information has always exceeded demand. This, this is a library. It's never crowded. Right. You know, so you can you can supply whatever you like. And I agree. They don't care. <laughs> yep. It's, it's, it's a big problem. Is that it looks like to run a modern society, you need a lot more. Um, Life's too easy. Well, you need a lot more information. You need the ability to interpret that information. You know, yeah. Um, Synthesize. Students aren't raising magazines or newspapers. Well, well, you got Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Everything's on the black. Who, who's, who's, wearing wearing who's wearing underwear and who isn't? Yeah. Yeah, that's what, that's really the driving force. Class. Yeah. You, know, you, know, you sort of criticize Twitter, right? But, but during the Iranian yeah. uh, uprising, that's that was one of the major sure. sort of outlets for information. Sure, it does have its uh, Only because any right. other one was shut off. I mean, it was by default. Right, but still, I mean, that was a source of, you know, question on you? Well, um, Twitter was a very interesting uh, situation, especially in China, because during the earthquake, I Yeah. Um, no, you're right. I mean, uh, for emergencies like that, uh, Twitter was terrific. It, you know, it, it, a number of cases has helped. The problem is that, I think what John was getting at, some others were getting at, is that those are brief messages about what's going on now. And for, for that, Twitter is terrific. But you're not going to get a complex analysis of something on Twitter. And that's what we're talking about here is that you know, to know what policy, so for instance, just healthcare reform, what's the best policy? It's so complicated. And you know, there, does, there is no media through which the general public can come to acquire the information they need in order to make that judgment. Um, that's the problem. <laughs> Um, with the internet, I find myself reading newspapers online, and I read other people's uh, analysis, and I, like, it's, it's, it's not, it, okay, back to the newspaper. I have a very interesting idea for the newspapers, but they don't, they don't tend to listen. You don't have to have newspapers that are, like, print block style, yes. and you can actually have them more artistic and more, be more like magazines and more colorful to the eyes, but they refuse to do that, and I, uh, I incorporate this TED Talk. About it, but well, it's probably a cost matter there, uh, but yeah, there may be ways of designing. I mean, it's a good point. There may be ways of designing newspapers that make them more attractive to people. But um, I don't know if you can do it. Magazine is popular. Pardon? That's why People Magazine. I think that was the intention of USA Today. Yeah, yeah. yeah USA Today is a different design. Um, you know, but uh, I don't know if that's going to solve the problem of newspapers. Okay. No, they've been very, you're right, they're very slow to change. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, they, uh, 
they're beginning to realize now that they need to change, but it's probably a little late for most of them. Okay. I had an initial comment about the gay marriage situation. Sure. Um, I think this is the reason why we have states. And so some states can agree to legalize it or make it part of their system, and then some states can choose not to. Right. And so all you would do is just move over to one state or not. And but it's a federal law that all right. states have to respect yes. the laws of the other one. Well, but, you think, but you're right. You could say, look, the federal government has no interest here. It's up to the states to, to regulate this. The problem with that is that if, if marriage really is a fundamental right, then um, it seems to me the federal government can't just opt out of the decision if it is a fundamental right. If it's an optional policy, a way to live, uh, then it might. But if it's a fundamental right, then it seems to me that the federal constitution has something to say about that. Um, and moreover, you're still going to have to get the states that don't permit gay marriage to recognize gay marriage when people move into that state. And what's going to happen if you get married in Massachusetts and then you move to Utah? Uh, and Utah doesn't recognize your marriage, then all of a sudden you're not married now? That's not, uh, so the federal government is going to have to exercise some oversight over your hands. Pardon me? Defense of Marriage Act, 96, since the other states don't have the right. Yeah, that's right. So that would have to be changed. Uh, yeah. So the federal government, I don't think it can avoid making a decision on this issue. I don't, um, well, I think I agree with um, the, the law that's already been made because um, if the state doesn't want to recognize that marriage, then why move there? I mean, the people there are probably going to believe the same thing and not going to be well, very well, respectful. Uh, so your job depends on it. Suppose you get transferred there. Yeah. Yeah. Get a new job. <laughs> but look, that, but look, say to get a new job, that's not easy. If you have a career in one industry, or if you have no job at all, you've been employed for a year and a half, to say, well, you know, get another job is not so easy. In other words, it puts enormous constraints on people, okay, to have to say, well, you know, you, you still have some choices here. Yeah, you do, but these choices are so coerced that it doesn't look like you're making your own decisions any longer about, you know, whether to be married or not. It looks like it's being imposed on you. For me, I think loving couples wherever, whatever, I mean, that kind of love is hard to find anyway, and we should stand in its way. I agree. But if the, if the federal government would recognize the 14th Amendment, that we all have these inalienable rights, what is gay marriage going to do harm to anybody? You know, I mean, why would that be an issue? And if it's a religious issue based on, then you choose what denomination that you want to go to and let that rule you. But because it is a religious issue, I, I believe, it seems like all the fights I've ever heard about it is that it's from a religious point of view and it's chipping away at our, our morals and things like that. But I don't think it has to be that way. And I, and I think you have to look at it as people have a right to partners and loving and that type of thing. But if it goes against your faith, then you just, you, you go to the church that does not recognize or, or will not marry. Mm -hmm. You know, even within my own denomination, there's lots of fights going on as to whether or not to marry somebody or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I think that's a denominational thing based on faith, just like you, some people drink wine, some people don't drink wine, you know, that kind of a thing. Now, I guess, yeah. It shouldn't be a national thing. Well, yeah, on the other hand, I'll even argue the other side, and I agree with you, okay, but the other side of it is that, look, if you uh, have a religious commitment and you think that gay marriage is a sin, then you have some interest in the government of which you are a part, the That's country true. of which you are a part, That's not true. engaging in sinful behavior. That's and so, uh, and given that I, I think that these identities are important in part that people love their religion. Uh, they make decisions in light of their religion. I don't think you can take religion out of the public sphere. I, mean, I think it has to belong there. Oh, I know that. You know, and, I believe that, too. Well, but a lot of liberals don't. I mean, a lot of liberals think it doesn't belong there. Uh, and it seems to me that's, I, I don't understand that argument unless you're going from the sort of impartial point of view when these religious attachments are not supposed to come with you when you enter the public sphere. But see, I'm committed to a sort of different point of view. So my, my view is that you can't, 
take religion out of the public sphere, so you're going to have these conflicts. You simply have to decide, right. you know, as you're a state. Right, you're what's best for everyone. Yeah, you simply have to decide, are you going to endorse this or not? And there's some religions that are going to end up being, uh, feeling that their interests are not being recognized. And that's true because, you know, we all have an obligation to put forth what we feel. And, right. and our faith, yeah. or lack of faith even, can be a pressure motivator for right. that. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. But because I mean it's, it's just it's, it's definitely a big issue in the Christian faith. But no I just don't see well, I think that it, judgment. It should be between the person and their God. Right, and I think that I mean you're right that in one in the, in the court case now that's in the federal courts, which is going to get to the Supreme Court pretty soon. Um, you know the uh, the the side that was opposed to gay marriage tried to make the case that it was harmful. But if you listen to the testimony, it's pretty, it's pretty dreadful. Uh, and it seems to me that they weren't able to make much of the case, and the social scientists and others that were testifying pretty much made it clear that, look, you know, nothing's going to happen to my marriage if, if gay people get married. Uh, so it really is a kind of, so in terms of what's good for the country, it doesn't seem to have any negative impacts there. So it really does seem to be a kind of religious issue. I don't know that this, I have my doubts that the Supreme Court will see that this is where Yeah. I absolutely believe in the right of marriage, the R I T E of marriage. Uh, it is a religious symbol. I'm an absolute separationist. I want to see all of the rights that you dearly love, whether it is baptism or final rights or marriage rights or anything else, done in the religious sphere. And if the polity decides that it wants to confer certain societal benefits upon people because of their status, it, it gives me a benefit because I'm a homeowner, but it doesn't give to a renter and yeah. off taxes, that's fine. Uh, if society says that the marriage between two heterosexuals is a valuable asset and they're a better uh, benefit for society than two guys or two gals, uh, then so be it. Uh, but if we decide, and statistics tell us, that homosexual and heterosexual marriages are equally unstable, then why do we want to benefit one group as opposed to another? And it's a societal decision now of giving a societal benefit based upon a religious doctrine and a religious designation. Mm -hmm. And so if we decide that heterosexual marriages and homosexual marriages both deserve, and we can afford to grant them the same right loss without going even farther broke than we are already, then let's do it. But otherwise, get the government the hell out of the business of marriage. Let churches do it. And if you can find a church that will marry two guys or two gals, good for you and you're happy in it. And then society will determine what benefits go to which categories of people. Yeah, but look, I mean, why can't society decide, look, marriage as an institution is a good institution. It benefits society in a variety of ways. And therefore, we ought to support the institution of marriage. Also, uh, because, I think it better, because I think that the state has an interest in promoting marriage. Okay? It, there's a variety of good things about that. Not, it's not to say everybody has to get married. Okay? But as an institution, it's an important institution. institution. It seems to me the state can say that without violating any kind of, uh, of constraint, you know, of neutrality constraint. Uh, the state can say that sort of thing and has an interest in it. Uh, and uh, it's, it seems to me the idea that you're going to eliminate uh, civil marriage is going to make a lot of people upset. Well, but I don't want to. I don't want to be civil unionized. <laughs> I'm married. So, uh, Dwight, how, do you, I, yeah, I, yeah, how many unions want me to belong to? Dwight, how do you see the difference in your eye between marriage and civil? Union? Well, because one tends to be uh, supported by society, the other one is unknown to society. I mean, most oh, people. Just, okay. Right? Uh, so, you know, in my, my view and the views of my friends and so on, I'm married. Uh, it would be awkward to say you were union. Something like that. You have to sort of come up with a different name. Because that one, that one's not the one. Will you civil union? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <That's all laughs> so something will have to happen with the message there. You're right. Um, I'm not sure if you're taking the assumption that state can be neutral. I'm not talking about just like state government or federal government, just state can be a neutral. Well, sometimes it can be. 
Sure. I mean, if, 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 if there's no state interest in something, uh, then the state doesn't belong in it. Uh, if it's for some practical reason, it's better for, if, if it's the kind of decision the state can't really make. Like, for instance, to my mind, the abortion issue is one in, in which some abortions seem to me to be morally justified. Some of them probably aren't. I don't think the state can make that judgment. I don't think it's in a position to make it. So it ought to, you know, uh, permit women to make their own decisions. Because I don't think the state's common to make it. So I think the state can be neutral, certainly. Uh, but often it isn't. Right? And I don't think that you can constrain the state. Most of the time, the state decides an issue. It decides on, it decides um, that one thing is good and one thing isn't. Okay? And that's not, that's not neutrality. In the 10th Amendment, states were given the rights for licensing, licenses. Mm -hmm. All right, so a marriage license, that's all the state is supposed to do is give a marriage, issue a marriage license. Yeah. And sometimes they even do it through churches. Churches will, yeah. mm -hmm. you can do it at your marriage ceremony, they assign a so, license and everything. But that's all actually that's really happening is just the license, period. The state is not saying this is a Christian marriage license, oh, no, no, no. this is a Jewish marriage license, this is a, you know, it's a marriage license. But so I think this you is... A, you've got to satisfy certain criteria. You can't be five years old and get married. Oh, well, I understand. Uh, that's, uh, of course. <laughs> but well, I think what the gays are and the lesbians, what they're going after is that right to acquire the state license. Then, if you want to also get married in a church of your denomination, that is separate. Well, some, some, I mean, some gays and lesbians agree with you, but some don't. Some want I mean, I, yeah. Because there's a, there's a, it's, it's about honor. So there's kind of honorific attached to the notion. That's why, that's why that, that happened in San Francisco. The mayor of San Francisco issued licenses because the state has the right to issue licenses of marriage, okay? Independent of where you're going to get married in whatever church or not, you know? Just like when you go to Las Vegas, they just issue a license, that's it, you know? So that is the fundamental issue that I think many religious uh, groups do not understand, is they feel like they are being encroached upon uh, because that is guaranteeing uh, the uh, gay or lesbian, the right to get married in any church, whether they want to or not. Well, no, Those churches are protected no. under the First Amendment. No, I yeah. no, They're right. protected under the First Amendment to refuse people I don't or, know that. or accept people in their churches but under, I don't think the, that under the Establishment Clause. I don't think the opposition to gay marriage is the result of some kind of confusion that the churches think that they're going to be forced to marry. Oh, well, that was the argument uh, during the whole pre-voting. Uh, that was a huge argument. Well, I mean, if, 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 that's, if that's the only basis for the claim, then the claim that doesn't hold any water because no, no the state's no, not going to force churches to marry. But I mean, it seems to me that for some churches, I mean, the argument is that, look, <coughs> gay marriage is a sin, and God is watching us all the time, right. and if you permit gay marriages, we're going to have earthquakes and floods and so on. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the argument. Gay marriage in Haiti, then. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, then, you know, Pat Robertson said uh, the earthquake was a product of the sinful life there. Okay, we're going to get close to wrapping it up now, so uh, any wrap up questions? We can do that. Well, it was fascinating. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.